uh, as you want. Uh, I think I think we are most of us. Okay, then then we'll start now. Okay, thank um, you. So hello everyone. Um, I guess you're all from Statistics Spain or or from that group, um, and we're going to be uh, talking for the next couple of hours about DDI, obviously, and. Um, we've tried to put together some uh, presentations that we hope you will find interesting. Um, I'm going to do a quick introduction and then, uh, well, actually, I have a slide on this. Give me a second here. Um, but before I go to that, I'd like to do some housekeeping. Um, we are making a recording of this and the slides and the recording should be available to you afterwards. We're going to cover a lot of material and that may or may not be easy for you to um, to understand as we go, that's okay. We'll this will be available afterwards for you to see. Um, a couple of things: we ask that people not put their video on and that they remain on mute during the presentations. Um, we the way we like to do questions, and we'll stop periodically to to take questions from people, is if you can put them in the chat and put the word question at the beginning. That is, is very helpful to us. So if you have questions while we're doing a presenting, put question, write your question into the chat. Jennifer um, Zieger is gonna be looking at that and making sure that we, we get questions answered when we make breaks to do that. And, and again, we'll have a discussion at the end. So, um, so if people can stay on mute and turn their video off, that's, that's really best, just, just so that we don't um, have problems with connectivity. So, um, with that said, I'm gonna get started here. My name's Aravan Gregory. I'm, um, I work primarily with, with CoData, which is the data arm of the International Science Council, but I have been consulting and working with the DDI Alliance for, for two decades and more. I'm a, a, I have a background in um, standards. I was one of the people who, who wrote SDMX originally, if you're familiar with that. So my, my focus has been standards around data and statistics for, for decades now. Um, and I'm gonna let the other speakers introduce themselves as, as we move forward. We're all members of the DDI um, Training Opportunities subgroup, which is the part of DDI that does this sort of, of, of webinar. Um, what we're gonna be talking today um, is according to the following outline, what you see on the screen. We'll be talking a little bit about the goals of this, of this workshop today. And I'm going to give you a little bit of an overview of how DDI gets used in official statistics. Uh, we're going to hand over to Alina to, to give you a little bit of detail on DDI codebook. And then I'm going to come back and talk about DDI lifecycle and some of the ways that it's used in statistical agencies. Now, uh, the person who was going to give that portion of the presentation, Flavio Rizzolo, is at Statistics Canada. And then you'll see some of his slides. Um, he had a family emergency as one is, was unable to make it today. So I'm filling him in for him. Um, after we look at DDI lifecycle, we'll turn to some tools and demos um, that Adrian Dusha will be um, presenting. And then and at different points, we'll stop and take questions. So um, please feel free to put questions in the chat and hopefully we can be a little, a little relaxed and make sure that, you, that your questions are answered. So, um, the goals of this workshop are, are these. I, we'd really like to give you some background on how DDI is used by statistical agencies, and they're a huge portion of our user base. A lot of statistical agencies use DDI in one form or another. Um, the, we're gonna introduce DDI Codebook and DDI Lifecycle, which are the two main specifications that people implement today. There are lots of other products from DDI and we'll talk a little bit about some of the others, but those are the two we're gonna focus on today. Um, I, we'd like to give you a, a sense of typical applications that statistical agencies build using DDI. And you may choose to do a, a number of different things once you learn more about the specification, but you have to start somewhere figuring out what you need and what you, what you want to build. And so we're trying to give you a little bit of background for that purpose. And we'd like to show you some of the available tools. Um, it, it, um, one of the things that we, I think we're gonna focus on is R. And I'd understood from email with you, David, that, that R was a tool that, that um, was familiar to, to a lot of people here. So I think, Adrian, you're gonna be showing some of the stuff in R is, is what I understand. I wanna emphasize yes. 
this is only an introduction. This workshop is not going to give you everything you need to know to do everything you ever want to do with DDI. That is not possible in two hours. And we're going to hit you with a lot of information. The, the point of this workshop is to get you guys started. And we are happy to, to continue to, to talk with you and to connect you with people who, who can give you the information you need and so on. And we have a lot of those connections. But first, you need to have a general idea of what DDI is and how you might use it. And so that's really the point of today. Um, what is DDI? This is a generic answer to the question, what is DDI? It's an international standard. So it's used all over the world um, that is primarily for describing survey data, but also other observational data, that's microdata, in the social, behavioral, and economic sciences, health sciences, especially public health, population health, and official statistics. That is the domain that DDI is, in, is, that's the audience that DDI is for. That's who uses it. And obviously you're included in that group. One thing all of those have in common is that they're about people. It's microdata about people. And that is really, if I had to describe it in the most general terms, how I would describe what DDI is suited for. Um, it's a free standard and it is applicable for lots of different aspects of, of data production, data use, data collection, um, and, and you'll learn much more about that today. But the point is, is that it's free, it's open source. And the idea is that if everyone uses the same models, the same approaches, then we can reuse and build on each other's work. And when you think about data and the way data is used, that is incredibly important. So the fact that it's free and open is an important part of what DDI is. There's no, you know, we will never charge anyone to use the standard. People may charge for tools, but we don't charge for the standard. Um, the idea is that there can be a community of people who can share resources and ideas and software and make interoperable networks and all of those things based on a shared understanding and interpretation of, of the description of their data. And that's aimed at people and it's aimed at computers. And the, the idea that DDI is computer actionable and computer readable is very important. It's not only for documenting things for people. Um, if I wanna answer that question a different way, I could say it's a metadata standard and there's lots of those out there, but what DDI provides is a structure for describing research and statistical data and a lot of the information related to it and a way of bringing that information together it's an open standard for data sharing and understanding and data reuse. And in the research world, people collect data for their own use first, and, and then it gets reused by other people. In the statistical world, the business is data production for use. You don't think about reuse, but that's the term that you hear in the DDI world for that because of the research orientation. Um, it's a mechanism for creating consistent machine actionable documentation for data. And when we say machine actionable documentation, that is basically the same thing as metadata. So those are those are those words mean the same thing. Um, DDI allows for the creation and use of metadata in a consistent way. And when we all approach metadata, using the same models and the same standard, we get a degree of consistency that contributes directly to data quality. And I'll come back to that point. But having consistency in the creation and use of metadata is a very valuable thing for people. It's an XML standard, primarily. We do support other technology uh, syntax expressions. RDF is becoming very common. People work in things like Python and R and, and JavaScript and on and on at JSON. And we support those, but primarily XML is what people have implemented DDI in. And that is still by far the biggest, um, the biggest user base, if you will, from a technical perspective. XML um, supports tagging text, tagging the metadata according to its meaning, not according to how it will be formatted. There are other ways of formatting XML for presentation to people. And that's the approach that we use. And I think Alina will get a little bit into some examples of that. Um, when, you, when she talks about codebook. But we're not gonna get too into the XML technology part of this today. 
um, we assume that people who need to have worked with and understand XML. Um, XML is nice because people can read it as well as machines. So that at least up to a point. Um, one very important aspect of DDI is that it draws a, a very clear line between information about data and the data itself. And I think within official statistics, people understand that division pretty well. Within the research community, that is not always true. But DDI is about metadata and it's a description of the data. And we'll, we'll, uh, you, we'll talk more in detail about how that relationship um, exists in the standard as we, as we go further on. Um, currently, there are two major production standards in DDI, DDI Codebook and DDI Lifecycle. Codebook is a lightweight version of the standard that is simpler to use, but that does um, supports fewer of the things that you may want to do with your metadata. It's really uh, uh, looking at an existing data set, one wave of co data collection documented in a way that someone could take as a, if it, a code book, it's called in the research world, that or a data dictionary might be another familiar phrase. So it's, it's a document in XML about a single wave of data collection. DDI lifecycle is much bigger standard, more complex, because it allows you to manage data and, and metadata across repeated data collection, across different waves, different cycles of data collection throughout the entire process. And we'll talk a lot more about that. So those are the two production versions of the standard. Now, there is a third standard that will be turned over to, to the committee that puts it out for vote tomorrow. So it's a standard that is essentially complete, but hasn't been formally approved by the Alliance yet, called DDI cross-domain integration. And that that's, I, I'm involved in that work. I'm the chair of that group. Um, and that standard is really looking at exchanging data across domain boundaries and integrating data from different sources. Um, it is not a production standard yet because it is not, it won't be released for a couple of months probably. Um, it's, so it's under public review now. Um, once that happens, you may want to look at it, but I think for your purposes, DDI Codebook and DDI Lifecycle are really the tools that you're going to want to use. So be aware that there's another standard coming along, um, but it's not something that would replace DDI Lifecycle or replace DDI Codebook. It's additional data to support integration, additional metadata, I should say. We also produce a lot of other products, vocabularies in RDF. Um, there are some standards for including your own controlled vocabularies and some recommended controlled vocabularies in DDI. Those are all available through the site. We won't talk a lot about those today. Those aren't the main products. The main products are DDI Codebook and DDI Lifecycle. And when people in the official statistics world talk about DDI, those are the things they're talking about today, most of the time. Um, an important part of the DDI standards is that they are designed to work with other metadata standards that do other things. Um, you may be familiar with, with the generic statistical information model out of uh, the um, HLG MOS at UNECE. Um, that's a, a conceptual information model that we've done a lot of work with. You might be familiar with ISO 179, which is about uh, metadata repositories. You might work with GIS systems and geography, with like uh, bounding boxes and these kinds of things, um, which, is, which is another ISO standard. We work a lot with SDMX. And then there are other standards that um, we also engage with. Those things are very important to DDI because when you implement a system, you might manage your data primarily with DDI, your microdata, but you will have to work with other standards for other purposes. And DDI is designed to, to facilitate that. It's an important thing to know. Um, within statistical agencies, DDI has been used for a long time. Um, I got involved with DDI in the year 2000. And the first user in the official statistics world that I knew about was Statistics New Zealand. And they were using DDI Codebook that long ago to document and archive data that, that, that they um, disseminated. Uh, DDI is used, Codebook is used in Inehi, Mexico. Statistics Canada used to use it. And there are a bunch of others I could mention. However, 
there is something that you want to know about called the International Household Survey Network. This is a group of UN organizations. It's the technical part is led by the World Bank, actually. Um, more than 200 countries have household surveys and other microdata, things like labor force, described in DDI codebook using tools and under a program that is run by the International Household Survey Network. And they produce a lot of good DDI codebook tools, um, including data catalogs, open source data catalogs, and so on. And um, well, there'll be a link on the next slide that you can follow and look at their data catalog. The software that does that is available for other people to run and use. Their, their tools are excellent, but more than 200 countries are using DDI because of that network, mostly in the lower and middle income countries, but also in places like France and Germany, which aren't really LMIC. Um, DDI lifecycle is probably the version of DDI that is most appropriate for use within statistical agencies. And certainly in Europe, this is what we see. Um, the HMA, HLG Moss, the high level group for the modernization of official statistics advocates an approach that has produced things like the generic statistical business process model you may be familiar with and GSIM and there are some other models. Um, DDI lifecycle is very much in line with that approach to modernizing statistical production. And I think that's of interest to you. Now, there are a lot of implementations within Europe and outside of Europe in line with that approach. INSEE in France is a very, very heavy adopter of DDI lifecycle. And I think in, the, in, in, in time, you probably want to speak to some of the people there who have built those systems and designed them. They, they do great work and they've done some very um, uh, forward looking things. Statistics Denmark does a lot of concept management and classification management with lifecycle, uses it now for other things. Statistics Canada is a big user, the Australian Bureau of Statistics, in the US, the Bureau of Labor Statistics, and so on. There are a lot of, um, an, an increasing list of implementers in the official statistics world for DDI lifecycle. <laughs> I'm going to point out that some of these organizations started out using Codebook and have moved on to using DDI lifecycle. That's true in New Zealand, that's true of Statistics Canada. Um, it's true in a number of other places. So that is something that, that might make sense for your purposes or not. And that's for you to determine, but um, the, they're good for different purposes. And I kind of want to talk about that for a second. DDI gets used for describing microdata. And that's important to know that we're talking here about providing people access to microdata and that there are often um, confidentiality issues and disclosure issues. But within Europe now, you have this idea that high value microdata should be disseminated by, the, by statistical agencies. And that imperative is becoming more and more important in a lot of areas. Um, DDI is, is the tool for that. STMX is very, very good for reporting aggregates and disseminating aggregates. But even though they allow you now, and they're providing support in their latest version for reporting and exchanging microdata, they are not a good platform for documenting microdata for the user. And I, um, I was one of the people who wrote SDNX. It's a great standard, but for the purposes of disseminating microdata and, and its production, DDI is a better tool. And I, I, want, you, I want to be very clear about that. Um, with Codebook, DDI Codebook, the biggest use in national statistical organizations and institutions is dissemination with Codebook. That is, if you're going to use Codebook, it's really for cataloging available data sets and describing them for end users. So they can take the microdata, they know what it is, they know how to work with it. And they're, they are able to, uh, to operate on it using tools. And Adrian will show you a little bit of that. But Alina's gonna talk in detail about um, DDI Codebook. DDI Lifecycle can also support those functions, but that's not its primary use. Um, here's the link to the International Household Survey Network data catalog. I don't wanna spend time looking at that right now but we can come back to that later if people are interested. It allows you to go and navigate the, at the variable level, the data in a huge, there are more than 10,000 surveys in that data catalog. And that's one example of how DDI codebook can be used. So it's quite a powerful thing. And that's something you probably wanna take a look at and moving forward. Um, 
when it comes to DDI lifecycle, and this is, a, a, I think, the most important imp implementation for statistical agencies, we're talking about metadata repositories and metadata and data management. DDI lifecycle is designed primarily for that purpose. This includes things like classification management, concept management, managing variables and questions and questionnaires. <laughs> All of these are things that DDI lifecycle is designed to do. We'll give you a little bit of a flavor of that later in the presentation, but that's the intended use. Um, describing questionnaires in a, at a very detailed level is a primary use case for DDI lifecycle. At INSEE in France, they have questionnaires that where they start by describing the metadata. They describe the questionnaire in DDI and they generate the document form of the questionnaire. They start with the metadata. It's something they call active metadata. And that is a really, really um, efficient approach. It's very effective in, in helping to manage the data that is subsequently collected. Now, they're very forward looking in the way they do that. But describing questionnaires with DDI lifecycle can be a very, very useful thing to do in managing data in helping people reuse the data and guaranteeing that it's done consistently and, and, and in managing the, the collection instruments themselves. If you're gonna do repeat data collection, which is a lot of what official statistics is, then having a, a good tool for managing your, your questionnaires and your questions is important. And DDI life cycles is designed to do that. So those are the main the main implementations of DDI in most, in most statistical organizations. I wanna step back now, and this is almost my last slide, um, and give you a, a, a perspective from a national statistical perspective on DDI. Um, data is serious business. Statistical agencies exist because data has to be high quality because it is the basis of policy. Everything governments do should be based on facts, and those facts come from statistical agencies. If you're serious about data, you have to be serious about metadata, because metadata is the information that you can use to guarantee that your data is the highest quality, to maintain its consistency, and to make sure that it is as good as it can possibly be. And without that metadata, you cannot manage the data well. Um, what DDI gives you is a proven metadata model, a proven metadata format for implementing systems in terms of its conceptual approaches, its implementation approaches, software tools. There's a big community around DDI that can help you understand and better work with your own systems and build your own systems. DDI is not just a technical specification. It's also the community built around that. And so I always like to say that um, if you're serious about metadata, DDI even though it's not simple, it, there's an investment up front, there's a learning curve, but the investment has a huge pay, payoff in the end and because of all of those things. So if you're serious about data and about metadata, DDI is something you need to look at. And, and I think a lot of people uh, would agree with that statement. At the end of the day, better data management means better data quality. And, and that is the most important thing for people whose business is the production of data. And that's, and that's who we are. So um, I really like to just hammer that point home. So that's kind of the perspective that we take on this. Um, and so that was my last slide because this slide is telling me that I'm gonna hand over now to Alina. Um, and probably Alina, you should introduce yourself. That's not much yeah. of one there on that slide. Um, and I'm, so I'm gonna stop share. Before you do that, uh, okay. we have one question. Is DDI also interoperable or aligned with DCAT? That's a great question. And I will answer it now. Um, you can certainly populate DCAT from the metadata in DDI. And that's true of Codebook and that's true of Lifecycle. DDI CDI is the product that I was telling you is, is going to be coming out in the next couple of months. We've actually worked with people on the DCAT um, committee at W3C very closely and made sure that, that you will be able to use DCAT as a, as part of the same implementation, the same metadata instance in RDF as the DDI metadata. So um, yes, DCAT is, is one of the standards we're very concerned with. Um, also SCOS, if that's one that, that, if you think about DCAT, you might be thinking about SCOS. The other one I should mention is schema.org. 
So um, yes, we are aware of those standards and working with them. I'm happy once we've been through a little bit more of the presentation to talk more about that at the end also. But that is an excellent question. And yes, those are standards that we're very aware of and, and, and familiar with. Alina, over to you. Thanks. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, so I am Alina Dancio. I'm a Romanian uh, working in Paris for 10 years now. Uh, I am the team leader of the research data management team at Science Po, the Science Po School. We are a, a, uni a private university. Um, we mainly have data in, in political science, as the name says it, election studies, stuff like that. But the difference uh, with what Erevan described is that our data mainly comes from researchers. So that's why I'm speaking about DDIC, because DDIC is perfect for us. Uh, we have some data coming from official statistics agencies on drugs and if it's not repeated data this is perfect uh, so let's move on uh, getting started with the di Aerofan said a few words and uh, i won't go through this slide but just to let you alina, know that not, you have yes we're not looking at your display alina we're looking at at, at your edit mode you go back to the top and put it in display crazy but i don't have a note wait Show yeah. it in edit mode and hit the display button if you if you show all. Yeah, it is it working now? I um, give us a second. No, can you hit the display button? Yeah, on, on, yeah. In PowerPoint, I, uh, and see if that does it. I think it's. Yeah, I must have. It's okay now. Ah, there we go. Yes, no, Yay. that's Yay! Perfect. Uh, Thank you. Okay. Great. So yeah, just to let you know uh, that uh, there's a lot of resources there uh, you found uh, some because you contacted us uh, the ddi training uh, group um, and the ddi website is also a valuable resource maybe even if can, it can be daunting at times because there's a lot of stuff in there uh, but do not do not hesitate to use it and you also have and maybe we'll send you after the zenodo collections that the ddi community is um, uh, where the DDI community is publishing it, the resources uh, it creates. Uh, so Erevan told you a little bit about why I use DDI, uh, so I won't go through that slide. Uh, but the benefits, the huge benefits of DDI is that uh, it's, a, as Erevan said, interoperable. You have a rich content that is granular, expensive. Uh, you, you can create um, a lot of stuff with it, uh, like data banks. And so we have an increased search capability in your data and the international community that is really active around this, this standard. Um, to be really honest, this is like the favorite part of my job that I do. It's not even a job, but being a part of this DDI community is really great and it can bring you a lot. Uh, and I remember myself 10 years ago now and I knew nothing, uh, but I learned so much from this community. So yeah, uh, I guess what I'm trying to say here, um, stay close. Uh, that's, that's, and exploit the community. Uh, so DDI it can be complex and challenging because like I said, it's it's complex and there's a level entry, but once you get it, it will bring you a lot. Uh, so Adrian will mention some of the tools that are on this slide. So I won't, I won't go through um, uh, this one and, uh, let's speak a little bit. Arafan uh, spoke about XML, so it's an, a standard that is expressed, a specification that is expressed in XML. So the XML uh, schema is a way, maybe you know it, but, but I'll just remind it quickly, is a way of tagging text uh, for meaning, not appearance. Uh, as Arafan said, normally people can read it, uh, or at least some of it and it is machine readable also. It will define which tags are available, the order of the tags, uh, whether they are required or optional, and if they are repeatable or not. 
so you have here uh, some some examples. Uh, you can read some of the stuff, uh, but this is just to let you know and to to make you aware that you'll need a tool. You won't have the time <laughs> or the interest to to write uh, XML DDI XML DDI like that, even if you're a super you have even if you have a super passion about this. Uh, so yeah, DDI is, is a powerful metadata standard, uh, but you have to be really careful uh, so that the correct information is entered into the appropriate fields when marking up the document, uh, because otherwise you'll end up with a lot of DDIs and you don't want that. Uh, for example, uh, what um, like four years ago uh, we realized that we have um, for the, pro the the producer or the authors, I I, don't, I cannot remember. We were using different fields, and that's not good. Um, so we had to harmonize that. So yeah, it's important to define from the start what you want to um, to enter and where. Uh, the DDI products, uh, I won't, um, I, I can maybe remind them quickly, um, but um, I'm focusing I'm focusing on DDI codebook. Uh, you'll have a presentation after from Erfan on DDI lifecycle. And uh, there's a lot of stuff there about DDI, CDI that will be published um, soon. So I'm really sorry my neighbors are moving in, so they are having some noise doing making some noise right now so sorry about that uh so yeah uh ddi codebook we we love this lego example uh you have on your left a lost metadata manager in um, the middle of a lot of not structured metadata and uh on your right metadata structured by ddi codebook by the ddi codebook uh standard uh, so DDI codebook is a structure that we will facilitate the production of machine readable codebooks. Uh, Erofan mentioned this and data dictionaries. It is built to emulate a physical codebook, uh, to catalog a data set, to describe a single study, not a repeated study. It's not ideal for that or a single round or wave in a repeated study. Uh, the latest published version uh, is 2.5, but there is 2.6 out there uh, also. Um, a DDI codebook uh, is pretty straightforward. Uh, you have uh, five main, main sections uh, and their name is pretty descriptive. So you have the document description, then the study description, the data files description, the variable description and other study related materials like questionnaires or reports or I don't know, uh, things like that. Uh, so let's, uh, I think you'll speak a little bit about this, about the study. But let me just go th quickly through this. Uh, so it's on the study level metadata, you'll have any information about the overall activity uh, that will be considered study level. So you'll catalog, you'll have cataloging and citation. Ah, sorry, citation information, uh, an abstract, an overall uh, descript descriptive information. Uh, you'll have information about funding. Uh, grants uh, about the um, organization, uh, all the methodological information, um, I don't know, about sampling, weights, uh, the purpose, the scope, the coverage. Uh, there are a lot of standards that you probably know, for example, Dublin Core, that only focus on this level of metadata. Uh, DDI do, does much more. Uh, so yeah, Dublin Core is sufficient for cataloging data, uh, but for practical use of data and for real data management, that is not enough. Uh, so DDI will include both cataloging metadata and the information needed for data use. Uh, as I mentioned before, studies uh, will include links to um, 
to the related uh, materials uh, that are already mentioned, questionnaires, things like that. Uh, I could show you after the presentation, uh, we have, um, but this is very research uh, data uh, related. Uh, we have a repository that is called Dataverse. Uh, you'll see, um, and I'm, I'm really not happy about that. Uh, in Even if we document, if we, the data managers document the variable level metadata because DTI allows us to do it, Mm, this platform won't show us uh, this information. So yeah, it's something we are not happy about, but please know that yeah, DDI allows you to document and to display uh, with appropriate tools, the variable level metadata. Um, I put some examples there. Mm, yeah, the literal question, the universe, the interviewer instruction, the notes, uh, where you can, I don't know, you can put information there about um, how you, you recoded the variables and the syntax that you used or stuff like that. Uh, so in a nutshell, in a few words, uh, the DIC will be an XML description of a classical code book, the classical code book used by researchers that is a data dictionary, and I suppose you all know, and um, you've seen already seen that. Uh, it uh, allows you to manage rectangular files. Uh, the concept of metadata reuse is not is not something that you will um, uh, do on a large scale. Uh, with uh, DDIST, even if it is possible. Uh, but yeah, in practice, we notice that um, it's not done so much with DDIC, but Adrian will show you how uh, you can do it. And uh, you should have that in mind uh, that it is possible, even if, yeah, I put in there no concept of metadata reuse. In practice, it's let's say not that easy. It depends for who. Uh, it is based on models in existing data anal analysis tools that you know, uh, Stata, SPSS, SAS. It includes Dublin Core and descriptive study level metadata. Uh, it is machine readable, slightly machine actionable, uh, int intended to describe data for a single study, one point in time, once the study has been uh, designed and fielded. Uh, Arafan mentioned the example of my French colleagues at the INSEAD that are now uh, designing their uh, surveys using DDI-L. Well, DDI-C is not designed for that. Uh, so it's yeah, an after the fact description to support archiving and reuse. And uh, it does that wonderfully. Um, and we are very happy about that. And our researchers are happy about that. Uh, so maybe I, I can show, I, Adrian will show you uh, some tools. And uh, yeah, if you're interested, I can also show you uh, what we have done with it at, uh, at ScienceBo. It works great for us. So. I think that's the, the message you want to hear. Uh, and I'll pass. I think I finished uh, Yeah, the credits. Uh, please do not hesitate if you have questions. And otherwise, uh, I'll give the word to Adrian. No, you uh, I think it's to our yeah. Not Adrian yet. Yeah. Ah, sorry. It's Flavio's piece. Um, <laughs> yeah, you're right. I forgot that. that um, we have a, we have a question here, yeah, which is how easy is it to switch between codebook and CDI? And that's I'm actually going to talk about that a little bit in the next piece. Um, I'm going to take over the screen here, Alina. Yeah, um, go ahead, please. Because we do have examples of people who have been using um, DDI codebook and then moved on to lifecycle. Um, in general, if you have a good handle on your metadata in DDI codebook, migrating it to DDI lifecycle is, is reasonably easy um, because you already have your metadata in a structured form. 
a lot of applications support both versions of the standard for dissemination purposes because you, you hold the metadata in a database and you express it in whatever form is appropriate for the user. So there are different requirements for combining the standards, um, but there are lots of systems that do it. And there are even tools designed to help the, that migration to go from codebook to lifecycle. Um, so I hope that's an answer for, for that question. And we can come back to that. Again, I'm gonna address this a little bit in the next section. Um, so as I said earlier, I'm, I'm sort of standing in for Flavio Rosolo from Statistics Canada, who is an individual you may want to talk to in future because he has a lot of experience working in, um, in, in official statistics, obviously. Um, the, um, we have one more question before I get rolling here. Someone asked, Alina, you said it's important to decide what to enter and where. You mean inside the same organization? Do you want to field that question, Alina? Uh, yeah, yeah, it's exactly what I mean inside the same organization. You would be surprised uh, about the things people can do, uh, even if they have a standard. Uh, to give you another example, when we weren't, I mean, it's pretty hard to find control vocabularies, at least in France, uh, for organizations. Uh, so what we discovered at, at another point uh, was that we had uh, research uh, laboratories that we had written like in three different ways. And DDI was, the tool was, yeah, it's a tool. So we had three different organizations and it was the same one. So uh, it should be aligned inside the same organization and ideally among. I mean, yeah, I, if I... Th there, is, there is a statistical agency that I worked with, Alina, and they did an analysis of how many non-similar versions of the ISO country code list they had used in their data yeah. over, over the years. And there mm -hmm. were more than 10,000 variations of the same, quote, standard code list. So yeah. I, I, I would That's like to emphasize... That's why I'm speaking that. about... <laughs> Absolutely. It's, it's, you do need to be disciplined about how you deal with the content of your metadata. And there are actually pretty good um, references to help you with that. And we, I, we can point you to some of those. But um, Alina, I think that that point is, is very right on this. You, you actually have to uh, be concerned with the content as well as just the technology tools and the software tools. Um, with that question, I'd like to move on and talk a little bit more about DDI lifecycle and metadata reuse. And I said at the beginning that um, DDI Codebook is a very good tool for data dissemination and for, for supporting researchers in using the microdata that you are providing to them. Um, but if you want to use your metadata to help drive production, cyclical production of statistics, then DDI Lifecycle is a much better tool. Um, so I'm going to I'm going to talk about three things here. The first one I'm going to talk about is the data life cycle, the life cycle in DDI life cycle, and metadata reuse. And I'm going to, going to show you some slides from Statistics Canada describing what they do. And these were, were created by Flavio Rizzolo, um, because I think they're a pretty good example of what it's like to seriously implement DDI life cycle to support data production. And they, they support a lot of standards in Statistics Canada. Um, but, but I think they, they are a good example to sort of illustrate what metadata reuse looks like there. Um, then I want to step back and talk a little bit about the terminology and the ideas that cut across both DDI Codebook and DDI Lifecycle about the term studies, which Alina's used, but also data sets and data files and how all these things, collections of data files, how do those things fit together in, in the DDI mindset? And then I want to take a closer look at questions and instruments, and that is one area, not it's not every area that DDI Lifecycle does in detail, but I want to show you that as an example of how detailed DDI Lifecycle is when it talks about metadata, when it documents things, because um, it is very granular, and I want to give you a feel for that. So I'm going to use questions and, and instruments, so questionnaires, as one example of that, even though DDI does things at, at a detailed level in a lot of other areas as well. But I do, the idea here is to give you a flavor for what reuse looks like, how you describe your data, and the kind of level of detail. 
This isn't going to be a complete introduction to all of DDI life cycle. That's probably not doable in a, a, a in a quick um, in in a short session. When you talk about DDI life cycle, this was the original DDI life cycle model, and it looks at what what is termed. It's really a research term. It's a survey, but it's called a study in, in the research world. And you you have an idea of data you want to collect of something you want to study. You do the data collection and field work after you design the instruments and everything. You process that data and that data gets analyzed and, and distributed and archived. People discover it and reuse it. And this back arrow should go all the way back to the beginning or anywhere in between. When you analyze data, you advertise its existence and people may look at your research and say, oh, I could use that data in my own research. And that's very common in the research world. Now, in the statistical world, I think this, this looks a little bit different. The point is that DDI can be used anywhere within this life cycle to help the processing and the business functions that are needed. And a lot of what that involves is metadata reuse because metadata that starts when you design a study is still being used the time, all the way through this cycle and back to the point where you're doing the next wave of data collection, right? So um, you may be familiar with the, the generic statistical business process model, which looks like this. Um, and this comes from the high level group on the modern modernization of official statistics. I think it's in version five something now, it's been through many versions and it has these high level functions and then lots of sub steps. And, what I wanna show you is what Statistics Canada has done because they use the GSBPM as a reference model for describing their own processes. And they have, they're using DDI lifecycle tools, a couple of them. So I'm gonna show you their view of this process model and where they use DDI. Now, they use a tool called Collectica, which is a, a DDI lifecycle metadata repository. It's a commercial software that they've chosen to use but it is a natively DDI lifecycle driven tool. Um, everywhere that it says Collectica here is a place where they're using DDI lifecycle. And if you count the boxes, you'll notice that it is used at some stage in every single major business function in GSBPM. Now, they also mention in a couple of places like in classification and reference metadata, a thing called ARIA. ARIA was a tool that also supports DDI lifecycle that was designed to do classification management at Statistics New Zealand and has subsequently been, um, is being used by other statistical agencies. Um, it is, again, a commercial tool because that's the, the choice that Statistics Canada made. They wanted commercial software that was supported. But ARIA and Collectica are both DDI lifecycle tools. Um, there's also some use of SDMX here at different points. But you can see across the data production lifecycle, DDI gets used more than SDMX because most of the data that you work with is microdata. And that is, is, I think, an important distinction here. It's also important to note that DDI and SDMX can be used together in the same overall process flows and are. And I imagine because Spain is part of Europe that Eurostat requires you to use SDMX for some things, for reporting and quality reports and so on. And those are things that um, are, are quite common in, in the official statistics world when people are using DDI. But you can see the GSBPM can be supported in many different places by DDI lifecycle. That's an important point. Um, when you think about reusing metadata, wave after wave after wave, cycle after cycle after cycle of data collection, you can imagine that there's a system that provides that metadata for reuse and for management. And I wanna talk a little bit about how that kind of a system works because for Stats Canada, that is that, that um, Collectica repository. But the key to it is identification. The identifiers in DDI are made up of three parts, an agency identifier, which is the organization or department that is responsible for creating and maintaining the metadata. There's an ID field, an item identifier for each little bit of metadata you have. And there's a version field. And together, those three things make up 
the, the identifier for any piece of metadata, every question, every classification, every node in every classification, every concept, every organization. So if, like that you could describe your sample frames with DDI and every organization has its own ID, every variable and so on and so forth. And you'll get a better sense of that as we move along. But this identification scheme is actually identical to the one that's used in SDNX. And that's not coincidental. It's a very, very good way of producing identifiers for managed metadata. And both SDMX and DDI do that. But if you can't identify something, you can't reference it. And that's important because the benefits of having all these separate items is they can be managed independently and they can be reused. When you reuse something, you reuse a specific version of it because there might be changes in the metadata and if it's used in many places, you may want to change it to the latest version also in many places. I'll give you an example of that in a second. You can track the history of individual items, individual questions, entire questionnaires, individual variables, entire data sets, time series. Um, you, you can get a much better idea of the provenance of metadata as it's collected, as it's processed, as it's disseminated, and as you repeat the cycle. All of that requires that you be able to identify and manage the items. And that includes tracking changes over time, of course. The point is that when I can point, when I have a metadata item with an identifier in a repository, I can reference it from many places. So I define it once and I use it many times. The phrase you often hear is single source of truth. There is one official version of any metadata item and you can point to it and always have it be the same. And that's, that is a huge benefit to consistency and management. Um, so what you see in DDI lifecycle are lots of references to a specific version of a specific item. And that item lives in a, in a repository and it is always the same wherever it's referenced from. And that's very, very important for metadata reuse and very important for supporting data production and managing that production from the metadata perspective. So here's an example. I have a scale, it's zero to 10, strongly agree, strongly disagree. Okay, and that scale could be used in a bunch of different places. I might have three different questions in different questionnaires in the same questionnaire that all use that scale. But <laughs> if I want to um, switch to a 12 point basis, for instance, in, all, in that scale, I would know every question in all of my questionnaires that use that scale. Um, so these might be the same questionnaire. This looks like these are question one, two, three from the same questionnaire, but they could be different questions in different questionnaires. And they would all point to that identifier for that scale. Um, that's a simple example. Think about a correction to a list of categories. So I have a code list with a set of, of categories of definitions, conservative labor, liberal Democrat, Scottish National Party, Plaid Kimru, that's Wales, and the Green Party. Um, Plaid Kimru, no, that's probably Scotland too, actually. Anyway, I don't know uh, British politics that well, but let's say I have a typo in Liberal Democrats, and I want to change that label to, from Liberal Democrat to Liberal Democrats. And I'm using that thing in many, many different surveys and data sets. I can say, find me every place I pointed to, because I'm going from version one to version two, I'm going to edit that that category in that code list. And I, I need to update every place that I use it for future data collection, future data description, and the questionnaires. Um, I can look into my management system and see that because the key, that reused item has changed, that it, need, that it might need to change everywhere. It might not, but it might need to change everywhere. And you can programmatically, systematically go through, find those places, and make the changes you need. So that's an example of how DDI Lifecycle uses this idea of reuse to benefit the management process. The bigger picture is this, and this is not a complete slide, but it shows you some of the metadata objects, the way they think about them in Statistics Canada. And I'll, I'm going to talk about the terminology here in a minute. I have series. So when I think about a series, I think about um, something like a labor force survey, where wave after wave after wave, I'm going out and interviewing people on the same topic with the same basic questions for the same purpose 
quarterly, annually, whatever the frequency is, but I do it over and over and over. Those series are made up of individual waves, individual cycles of data collection. And the term that gets used for that is study unit. They produce data files for variables that use code lists that are informed by the definitions in categories. The questions use those code lists in my questionnaire, which is my survey instrument. All of these things and a lot more are managed separately with these references, the arrows you see in this kind of diagram. Um, and that's how DDI lifecycle looks at the world. And that's how it's used to support the, pro the overall production process because each of these things can come into existence and be used at different points in that life cycle. But if you have a picture of how they're connected and what is used where, then you can manage the entire process better. And so that is, I think, an important idea. The terms are not really official statistics terminology. Um, and I'll come to that in a second. There was a question earlier about whether you can use um, DDI Codebook and DDI Lifecycle together and what that migration looks like. In DDI Canada, in Statistics Canada, they were doing DDI Codebook for special surveys. Um, so they had a, 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 a research laboratory and they were working with a group called the Data Liberation Initiative in Canada for decades now. Um, providing microdata to qualified researchers, academic researchers and policy researchers. And they held these files in a safe data center, their research data center, documented in DDI Codebook, which is, um, and the Data Liberation Initiative used Nestar was a tool for creating that metadata. And those codebook instances were used by StatsCan. Now, when they made the move to DDI Lifecycle as a, a production tool in Statistics Canada, they already had some of their microdata documented in DDI Codebook. And so they used a thing called Rich Data Services and, uh, and the Collectica repository that I've told you about already. And between, so Rich Data Services gave them tools for identifying the, the metadata in their codebook and identifying the reuse so that they could migrate from the codebook description independent waves of each series, each, each um, survey and combine those into a Collectica style reuse where the code lists that were repeated wave after wave in codebook were um, produced once in Collectica and referenced from all the different studies. So they use this combination of tools to do that migration, but this is a fairly common scenario. Um, and, that's, and, and this is the sort of scenario that some statistical agencies have gone through, but it's an example of, of how this sort of migration um, can be done. And again, there are people who you could talk to um, about what that looks like if it becomes important to you. This is their overall architecture. Um, they have this, what they call a metadata hub with APIs for different tools and, rep and repositories. Statistics Canada is a very large, very distributed organization, the way most national statistical organizations are. And so they have within that hub different APIs to talk to different systems. And I don't even know what these acronyms mean because this is Flavio's slide, but they have lots of clients that use the metadata in their metadata hub. Now, they also have a lot of tools and repositories that are the back office of that hub, Collectica, ARIA, there's some SDMX tools, they, they use the ESTAT ones, et cetera. And so that set of tools speaks using this, a limited set of standards, DDI lifecycle and SDMX primarily, for talking to the metadata hub. And that metadata hub is a service center within the organization um, to support all of the metadata used within Statistics Canada. This is the kind of architecture that you see in most organizations that use DDI lifecycle to drive production. So they have lots of different groups of users working through different APIs to some sort of central catalog supported by the applications that are the repositories for managing their data and managing their, their metadata. And so down here at the bottom, their lifecycle management is based on Collectica and ARIA and some SDMX tools. Their metadata hub, their catalog, their central repository that users interact with is a view of that appropriate to the different user groups and applications. And some are machines and some are people. So I think you get the idea here. So people have a much better idea of where their data is coming from, how the metadata is evolving, all of the information they need 
through whatever UI they're comfortable using. Now, you have to be careful. You don't want to have to support too many client applications through the hub, but that's just a technology management challenge similar to many other things. And they do provide in that hub a lot of mapping to other standards. And you see here DCAT, um, DQV, you see XGOS and SCOS, et cetera, et cetera, PROV, lots of different flavors of the same metadata, but it's being managed in DDI lifecycle, SDMX. That's sort of the key to this slide. Um, I'm gonna shift gears here now, and this is where I'm gonna talk a little bit about terminology. I'm gonna talk about the study, and this is really a reminder of something Alina already mentioned. I'm gonna talk a bit about data sets, data files and metadata instances, and the differences between codebook and lifecycle. <clears throat> the term study is not probably that familiar to you. And that's, it really is a, a research term. The term I would use in a statistical office is survey, probably in English. Um, that is the activity of collecting data on an ongoing basis around one in one area. So a labor force survey, census, national accounts. Um, national accounts, not a good example, not so much microdata, but um, you have many, many different surveys within a statistical agency. Each one of those is a study in DDI, and specifically, it's a series of studies, because every time you go out in a cycle of data collection, that is what is meant by a study or a study unit in DDI. So in lifecycle, the term you see most often is study unit. In codebook, the term is study, but um, it's one wave of data collection within a survey the same methodology, the same questionnaires, et cetera, et cetera. Wave after wave is a series of study units. And that's, I know that's not familiar terminology, but you need, you need to be able to translate that if you're gonna work with DDI, it's not so hard. Um, DDI is not about the results of analysis of data. It's about the data. It's a metadata standard for describing data and people do lots of things with data to produce policy reports and different analyses, and that's fine. Those things can be related to the data, but DDI is about managing and documenting the data and not the outputs, not the analysis outputs. Um, so I think um, Alina already showed you sort of the study level metadata. I'd like to emphasize that things like methodology are incredibly important in a statistical agency, and you can document those in a fairly uh, thorough way but mostly for human readable purposes in DDI. We don't give you a computer processable model of methods um, because that's an incredibly complicated thing to do, but you can document the methods that were used and that's very important. And in reference to things like the catalogs produced by Eurostat and other places. Um, we work with a lot of other metadata standards. Someone asked earlier about DCAT. DCAT has a lot of Dublin Core in it, so does schema.org. Um, and you saw a list of those examples also in the Statistics Canada slide. And then we have this idea of linking to other kinds of metadata. And I wanna talk a little bit more about that. Um, the primary thing you care about is connecting the data set, not just the data file, but the data set to the survey, to the study. And so very often you have metadata about the study and it, it talks about it contains the metadata for a number of different data sets, one or more data sets, and those data sets may be one or more data files. The data set is a logical construction. The data file is a storage mechanism. That's a very important distinction in DDI. So we have a study description that talks about all of the data. You have data sets that correspond to, to the data sets, and then you have the data files that contain the data for those data sets. And they may be one for one, but they might not be one for one. And that distinction is important in the metadata. The data is just lives where it lives. Um, so your study defines the high level information, and then you might have data sets for say a hierarchical data set that has households and persons or businesses and persons. And there are lots of different ways to do hierarchies. You can break them out by country or region. Um, however you do that is fine. DDI doesn't dictate a particular kind of, of breakdown, but they let you describe the way you've organized your data in different data sets with different relationships. And that's important to know. The study covers everything. Your data sets are the logical distinctions in your data, hierarchical or not, and then your data files are physical. <coughs> so 
Um, I think I've already said what's on this slide. The packaging, organization, and encoding of data is at the file level. The logical contents of data are at the data set level. Um, and the information that's related to everything in the data set can be stored at that level, or you can talk about things that are specific to data files. Um, here's an example of a rectangular file. It's a very stupid example because you would never put the person's name in as their ID, but um, here I have a bunch of cases, Marie, Henry, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And for each one of those respondents, I've recorded a set of variables, sex, when they were born, when they died, the reference area, the longevity, et cetera, et cetera. And these are all different variables. And so this is the typical view of data that you see for any kind of person level information. Now there's a lot of other data out there, administrative data and so on, but DDI is focused primarily on this rectangular data. If you have to deal with a lot of administrative data, DDI CDI is something that you might wanna look at, but um, most of your data is gonna be like this. And you have this logical idea that you have cases and variables, and that's the core of how data sets are described in DDI. Even though you might break some of your cases off into a different file or some of your variables into a different file. What you have here in the logical description are your variables. You have information about he how each variable is represented. So I know that person ID is a unique identifier. I know that the categories for sex are male and female, and I know the codes for those things. Um, although that's not logical, that's more physical. I know that the date of birth born is a date time. I know that the date of death is also a date time and so on and so forth. I know that longevity is a number of years. All of those things are described in the metadata about that data set, okay? And a lot of them are logical things. They're meanings, they're definitions. They're not encodings as such. But we also, of course, talk about the encoding. That's in the physical description. So when I describe the representation of a variable, they're gonna be in a certain sequence in the records. There might be fields that act as foreign keys um, that link data sets. There might be formatting. I might have delimiters. Um, different files may live in different locations on different servers. All of that can be described, but it's separate from the logical description of the contents of the data set. Um, there is, however, a category of metadata that is useful at the logical level, but specific to how the files are, are, are packaged. Summary statistics, category statistics, things like checksums. This is metadata that you can only really compute based at the file level. And so we do attach metadata also at that level where it's meaningful. And that's a, a little bit blurs the distinction between straight logical and straight physical description, but that's the metadata. So you have to do it that way. And that's how DDI does it. Um, so in a study, you may have a bunch of different files. You can have different holdings in different repositories. And you can think of that if you know DCAT as distributions in DCAT. Um, so you may have many different subsets of a larger data set, and you can describe that within the study. You have waves of, of data collection in DDI lifecycle. Um, the data itself is typically held in ASCII format. Now, it is possible in DDI to describe data in in binary formats, in proprietary formats, you can do that. Almost no one does because the tools like R, like SAS, like SPSS, prefer to work with ASCII data. And it's easier to manage and report in that form. But the data files tend to be delimited or fixed with ASCII files. The metadata is in XML. DDI does not put the data into XML. SDMX does that, DDI doesn't. And so it's an important distinction. Um, the metadata is very separate. It's managed and packaged separately from the data that it refers to. The data is in files, then you have XML files for the metadata. Um, the metadata files can be cited and managed and their items, their metadata items can be managed independent of the data they describe. And that is very important when you're managing repeat data collection. Um, this slide shows you a, bit, a few of the differences here between codebook and lifecycle. And most of this we've probably already mentioned. DDI Codebook, you can describe things after the fact for one wave of data collection. And you can describe aspects of the questionnaire that was used. You can include a PDF of a print questionnaire, for instance. Um, however, it doesn't give you a machine actionable way to drive data collection in the way that DDI Lifecycle does. And that's the big distinction here. DDI Lifecycle is for 
doing the data collection and production. DDI Codebook is for describing what has been collected afterwards. And that's why DDI Codebook is a good cataloging and dissemination format where Lifecycle is a good production tool. And that's the major difference here. I'm gonna step uh, change gears again and talk a little bit about instruments. I wanna see there's a question here. Um, and, and that question is about code lists and that's a very good question. What we do in DDI Codebook is you describe the code list when you describe the variable that uses it. So inside the description of a variable, I say, here are the codes and here are their descriptions. And I just list them out. And maybe Adrian, you can show people what this looks like later. In DDI Lifecycle, I have a thing called a code list. And the code list is a list of codes that can be hierarchical. You can describe classifications also. And they point to a, a list of categories that are their definitions. And that model is very, very aligned with GSIM and the Neuchatel model for classifications, if you're, if you're familiar with those things. But the code lists in DDI Lifecycle are reusable, complete descriptions of the codes and the categories they use. And categories are kind of concept, a definition. The codes are the encoding. And those things can be reused. You can take the same definitions and recode them um, in a different code list. And you can manage all of that in Lifecycle. In DDI Codebook, you cannot. It just describes what was used in that variable in the file. And that's, that's where this difference enters the picture. Um, I'd like to do a little bit of a deep dive in a different area, though, which is around questions and questionnaires. And again, this is not something so that you become a master at describing questionnaires in DDI. It's really to give you a flavor for how DDI Lifecycle describes these things. Um, so I'm going to look a little bit at the instrument. An instrument is the DDI name for a questionnaire. I'm going to look at question items, which are the questions themselves, the different response domains, so code lists and different kinds of responses, the different types of questions that we support, how questions can be reused, how questions fit into the description of a questionnaire of an instrument, and how we describe the control flow that is the go-to logic, the skip logic in that questionnaire. Um, I know, again, it's a terminology thing. The word instrument isn't a very familiar term, but it is the term that DDI Lifecycle uses to describe questionnaires, as well as other kinds of collection things, which is why they use a generic term like instrument. But a DDI questionnaire is a data collection instrument, and it allows you to take a bunch of components, individual questions and responses and all the different pieces, and assemble them into a questionnaire. And you do that in reference to the metadata items that you would have in a central repository, basically. And again, INSEE is a great place to, to see how this can work. Um, so I can describe an individual standalone questionnaire in DDI Lifecycle, but very often I'm making references to reusable components held in a system external to the just the questionnaire itself. So the, the questionnaire is an assemblage of components. And that means the components are reusable. And the, but think about that for a minute. If I reuse the questions and the response domains, the data that is collected with those questionnaires is comparable. And I know exactly that it's comparable because I know which question and which code list was reused in collecting that data. So comparability of instruments directly means reuse of these components directly means a data that is comparable across waves. And that means that non-comparable data can be identified and handled. And that's important. In the, in the ongoing cycles of data collection. Um, and then you also have these com control co com con construct components that describe flow logic. They aren't as reusable. They're really part of the instrument. They can be reused, but people don't typically. Um, so here I have some question text. On an average weekday, how much time in total do you spend watching television? And that question text <laughs> is associated with a code list. And the code list has a set of valid codes. So it might be no time at all. It might be less than half an hour up to more than three hours. And this is probably an old fashioned question because people spend a lot more time staring at their smartphones and their computers than they do the television. But you get the point. And then I might have missing values. And those missing values are, are important too because non-response is always an issue. And DDI lifecycle allows you to understand what is a substantive code 
and what is a missing value code. You can always, those things are distinct. And that's important because the missing values can change system to system. Um, where the substantive ones are logical, they're always the same. So these are different pieces in DDI. Um, I have a lot of different kinds of response domains. I have code lists, which are codes related to a set of categories that define them. I can have scales. I can have numeric responses of all kinds of different types. I can have textual responses, and I can say things about the length of the text and the, the range of the text and so on. Um, lots of different uh, uh, facets of the text, as similar to what's in XML schema, if you're familiar with that, or Java. I can have date times. Typically, people use ISO date stamps, but you don't have to use ISO. You can use any kind of date times that your system support and describe those in DDI. Um, but that's so pretty much anything you would see as a response in a survey you can use. You can mix these types in a single response if you want to. So there, I, I have yet to meet a, a, a questionnaire that couldn't be described in DDI lifecycle in the latest version. It's very, very co comprehensive. Um, in terms of questions, sometimes you have very simple questions like the one I showed you. Sometimes you have question grids, and I, you guys are probably familiar with that, where you have a sort of table or a cube structure and you can enter questions in whatever sequence is, is, is convenient. And that's a very common form of, of data collection. Um, and DDI allows you to describe that. Um, and so we support that. You may have blocks of questions that only make sense when they're used together. Often these are questions about some stimulus, like a video clip or a picture or, or what have you. Um, and we support that as well. So all of these things are available to you for use, but these are the main types I think that you see in, in official statistics. Um, so what I can do is say, all right, I have this, this set of, of surveys and they each have multiple waves and some of the waves use a particular question with a particular representation and particular missing values. So I can describe this and these would be references into my system. So I have a question bank. I have a metadata repository that contains the code list and the categories. Um, and my waves might or might not reference that question and use it in those surveys, in those question instruments, in those, those questionnaires or survey instruments for each of those areas and, and for different waves, yes or no, depending. And so it's very flexible. And because you're using this sort of um, use by reference, pointing into the repository, you're allowed to do this and to understand exactly how it's being done, which, it, which is very important when you're managing your data. Um, I think you've seen this slide before, so I'm gonna skip it. It basically says the same thing as it did before. Here, however, you're beginning to see the different versions of things that might be used um, because historically you might've used an older version and you need to point to that older version, even though, in, the, in, the, in another survey or a later wave, you're using an updated version. And that's all possible to describe. Here's um, breaks out a little bit more detail what you can describe about a question, because I have question items with their text and their representation. I might have re instructions to the interviewer. I might have universe statements like all respondents. I might have external aids that I, are used to, that are presented to the respondent when they're answering a question online or in person and so on. All of these things are components that are available for use in describing a questionnaire. <clears throat> um, are people familiar with skip logic in questionnaires? You are whether you know it or not very likely because people who answer one question might not have to answer the following question or might have to answer additional questions. I may have to go through a question about my children several times because I have several children, right? Those kinds of, 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 we call it instrument flow in DDI. That kind of flow logic, it can be described in a, a way in DDI that allows you to drive computation with it. I can, I can do computer assisted instruments with the DDI lifecycle description. It's very important. <clears throat> and the main things you use are question constructs, that is, references to questions and all of the things that we've been looking at, sequences of questions, statements that are presented to the user, which might be instructions or other things, and then flow logic. Um, as an example, here I have a question about how much TV you watch. And then um, another question about TV watching, but if I don't know that I watch TV at all, or I don't 
watch any, I don't have to answer the second question. So I can describe that in a structure. This would be an XML structure in DDI, and this is a sort of breakdown of it. Um, but there would be this construct that says, if the condition, if A1, this question has an answer of one to seven, ask A2. If it's zero, zero, go to A, A3. And I can describe that in this flow logic as part of my questionnaire. And I could feed that into a computer assisted system that administers the questionnaire for the respondent, for the interviewer, depending on what kind of system it is. You can describe this computational logic in DDI lifecycle, very important. And the way I do that is I have statement items, and these are sort of statements in the instrument. I have the, the points where questions are presented and used. I have if then else logic, so conditional logic that says if they meet this condition, then do this, otherwise do something else. I can loop, like for enough people's children. I can repeat until, I can repeat while. If you're a programmer, you're probably familiar with these kind of constructs, and that is intentional. This logic is, is the same logic that computer programs execute when they administer questionnaires and when they do pretty much anything else. So that is um, what DDI lifecycle gives you. Okay, that's an awful lot of information. So I'm going to give you a bit of a summary. I have here a question. What am I really looking at? I have a number and a name, the name for the instrument, so question A1 and an identification in DDI. I have some question text. I know what that is. I have that captured. Then I have a response domain. In this case, it's a coded response that has categories and codes, some missing values, some substantive values. I have some instrument flow and some instructions. So I'm going to show you a card. And that card is going to help you answer. And you look at card one. And that would be a, a, you know some sort of external, uh, like a PDF file of the card. Um, and then I have the skip logic I was talking about. I have my code list and my categories and my code values, and all of that is in my repository where I can reuse it. That includes a different list with the missing values that also might be reused. So I have all of these different pieces going on, and I describe each of these ind individually, bring them together, and compose an instrument out of these pieces. And that description is absolutely computable and can be presented in a human usable way as a questionnaire or as a PDF for dissemination or data collection purposes. And that's how it, what it looks like. Um, I'm gonna stop with that. Again, that was just an example of the level of detail that DDI Lifecycle goes into. I wanna talk about some of the resources because you probably understand that there is a lot here and a lot to learn. Um, you probably know about the DDI website itself already. And that's a, always a good resource. Because you're an official statistics organization, you probably want to follow the work at the high level group for the modernization of official statistics. Probably you already do. Um, that's a link to their high level website. They have a lot of working groups, a lot of standards. Um, they are very worth getting involved with if you have the, the, um, the resources to do that. You meet a lot of very smart people who are very involved with DDI, SDMX, and a lot of other standards, GSBPM, GSIM, and so on. A great community. Um, there's a new conference that is going to be that is being organized at INSEE called Cosmos, and this is a metadata conference for official statistics. The first time that conference is going to be organized will be next spring in Paris. INSEE is the host organization. They have they are are only now starting to prepare the announcements. Um, but if you um, keep your eye out for Cosmos, I think that could be a very useful conference for you. And Paris isn't so far away. Um, the, the annual conference that is, I think, my favorite DDI conference all year is the European DDI Users Conference. Um, this happens in, in early December every season. The next one will be in Ljubljana in Slovenia. Last year was in Paris. Alina was the host for that, and she's one of the organizers. Um, you get people from all different backgrounds coming together to present how they're using DDI and to talk about things. There are, I don't know, dozens of good sessions. They teach workshops. It's a great community and people are really open-minded and interested in learning from each other and talking. You meet a lot of the people involved in designing the specifications and so on and the software implementers. So it's a, it's a great um, conference if you, if you have the ability to attend and I would recommend that you do if you get into using DDI. The other thing that you really need to do if you haven't 
is to join the DDI user list. And if you follow that link, you can register for it. All of the updates about events and new publication and so on in the DDI Alliance um, will appear in notifications sent to that list. So you subscribe and you'll just get the emails as those announcements are made. And um, Jared Lyle, who is the executive uh, secretary of the DDI Alliance, he's the head of the secretariat, will po consistently post to that list. If you have questions, you can ask them on that list and you will get answers from the community. So it's a very, very good resource. Um, I just wanted to mention those. Um, before I turn over to Adrian, I'm gonna take a look at the questions here. Oh, we have a post about Ljubljana. Um, okay, question about Sims. Um, so Carmen, that's an interesting question. Now, um, Codebook, DDI Codebook, does not have a lot of overlap with Sims, except that some of the, of the information that you will have in DDI Codebook at the study level will populate the fields in SIMS. Um, SIMS is, requires an SDMX uh, structure. Um, however, there are organizations, and Statistics Denmark is, is the one that, that I'm aware of that does this. They actually use DDI, although they're using DDI lifecycle, to populate SIMS, and they even built an interface for their version of the Collectica repository that has all their, their metadata in it. And so you can assemble a SIMS instance in SDMX based on the, their DDI repository. Um, so people, some of the metadata that you have at the study level, at the level about each wave of data collection is exactly the information that you'll report using SIMS to Eurostat. So um, there, that is a connection where the, the formatting in XML is not the same, but the content um, doesn't correspond one for one but a lot of the concepts are the same and can be um, moved from your, uh, your microdata metadata directly into a SIMS report for the purposes of reporting to, to Eurostat and dissemination of that information using SIMS. So that's a very good question. Um, I should stop and ask if we have any other questions. I think we don't at this point. Are we good? Um, oh, no, we do have more questions. I'm, I'm bad, on, bad on me. Um, there's one, is DDI used to describe how microdata are physically stored or is it thought better to, to use a, a logical representation of microdata? Okay, a lot of people use key, key value stores for their metadata. One of the organizations that is a heavy user of DDI Codebook and DDI Lifecycle is the UK Data Archive. It's hosted mostly out of the University of Essex in the UK. They work very closely with ONS for a lot of the of um, for some of the data that ONS produces. Also, they they house a lot of the long running studies um, that ONS also also bases their statistics on. Um, they under the covers they use a big data key value store for all of their data. However, when they present data for dissemination through their website, they provide. DDI codebook document, documentation. And when they feed their processing systems, they package that data. You query the key value store, you get a rectangular data file, and that data file is documented in DDI lifecycle. Now, so their production use of DDI is in lifecycle. Their data store is a key value store. Their um, dissemination is driven by DDI codebook. They are now exploring the use of DDI CDI, because they're also looking at doing a lot of cross-domain data integration and bringing on board a lot of data from things like Copernicus uh, environmental data, like temperature readings and energy usage statistics that are, are fed off of sensors and so on. So at, to accommodate new data, they're looking at CDI. For their own data, per, data documentation and, and sort of production purposes, they use Lifecycle. For their dissemination to end users, they use Codebook. But at the, behind it all is a, is, a big, is a big data store that's a, essentially a key value um, uh, data store. So that is a combination you see and can be very powerful because it's very scalable. And you probably know that about key data stores if you're using one. Um, but the microdata is held with key data. So that's, um, okay. I think um, if there are no more questions here, hang on, I've got to then I'm gonna turn over to you, Adrian, to show people, I, I think you can show people maybe Nestar or some editing interface and then some of the, of the processing stuff. Um, so 
um, take it away. I will stop sharing and you can you can um, begin. Okay. okay, thank you. Thank you so much. So um, my name is Adrian Dusha. I am teaching at the University of Bucharest in social statistics. I'm also the director of the Romanian Data Archive and um, uh, the national coordinator of the European Social Survey. So I have different hats, but in all of them, I've been collaborating with the DDI community for yeah almost 30 years now. Now, the purpose of this last part is to make a live demonstration of how to use free and open source tools to populate the DDI codebook. You've seen in Arafan's presentation about commercial tools, I am more inclined to using open source tools. And that's what I've been doing for the past uh, 10 years or so, uh, develop tools like that. Now, as mentioned, the, the code book contains five sections. You can look at them here. Out of which the most labor intensive is the variable description, which is in the data description file uh, uh, section over here. And you can notice there are almost 70,000 lines of code there. Um, and that's a lot of work if you want to do it manually, but fortunately it can be done um, in a machine actionable way. Um, uh, there used to be a single main software like two decades ago to facilitate this process called Nestor. Uh, its development was discontinued for some good years, but it is still downloadable. And I will uh, show it, uh, I will show you how, how to use it later on. I mean, here you can see, I've, I've only found um, uh, a downloadable link at the International Household uh, Social Network or something like that. Um, but fortunately, uh, there are other tools that have been created to automatically extract metadata from uh, variable labels, value labels, uh, information about missing values, as, as you've seen so far. Um, and since this audience is fluid in SAS and keen to learn about R tools, uh, I'm going to focus my presentation on R-based tools and show they can interoperate with SAS. In, in fact, I have been doing a, 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 a two weeks um, marathon before this uh, webinar to improve on the current versions of the DB, of this R package that I'm going to show you today uh, and to facilitate more SAS interoperation. Okay. Uh, but before going into specific R commands using this uh, package, I will first show, because I, 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 I'm a developer, I am used um, and, and create tools for users. I want to make them as easy as possible, but I'm also aware that not all users are programmers. So in fact, um, first I will show you a graphical user interface that uses this uh, R package. It's using, it, it, it has R embedded within. And that is called stat converted. That is an open source and cross-platform alternative to commercial solutions. And most notably, maybe you heard about stat transfer and I will, I will show it to you later today. Um, that converts data set from one statistical package to another. And it's based on DDI and, and as you can see, it can read and write I, uh, uh, SPSS, uh, status SAS, or um, even Excel. Uh, and on top of everything, it, it also flew it on producing DDI codebook and reading DDI code files. Now, based on my very recent experience, I'm an R user and have almost zero experience with SAS, but I, I in, in order to make this presentation, I, I tried to learn a little bit of SAS in order to produce these tools. Um, out of all statistical software here, SAS, I think, is the closest one to the spirit of the DDI lifecycle and in, in the principle of reusability. And that is because unlike these other softwares, like SPSS, RS data, all of which keep the metadata in the same file with the data set, SAS keeps its metadata in a separate file called a catalog. And I think that kind of makes sense because very often a lot of variables have exactly the same response options. And especially in social statistics, I'm thinking about one to five liquid type response scale for, for multiple items. Um, and uh, reusing those, it, it, it makes sense. And as you can see here, I'm going to use a test data set. And you, you can see there is a separate file for the data, SAS 7B cat, and for the catalog, SAS 7B cat. Um, and um, uh, start converting, you can download, install on your computer, either on Windows or Mac OS. And I'm going to open it here. 
just to make a demonstration. I'm hoping I'm, I'm not going to break anything, right? So I'm going to use SAS as the input type and uh, go to this. Notice, please, that there is no special place for selecting a data catalog file. Um, and uh, by default, Stat Converted and, and the DDI um, with our package expects that catalog to be in the same folder and using the same file name as the data file. But in the command line uh, in R, it is possible to specify a certain path to a, a, to a file. But for, for this purpose, for the Stat Converted, it, it is sufficient to have it in the same folder. Right. And now you can look at the variables. It's very similar to that transfer, actually. Um, and for instance, um, um, uh, let's let's look at some of the labels here, um, like countries, countries over here. You can see the uh, key value pairs and the net the internet use. You can see um, we have some uh, missing codes. There are uh, here, uh, 93, 94 also, but these are not typical SAS uh, extended missing values. In SAS, the, the missing values are presented by a dot or for system missing or dot A, dot B, and so on and so forth. Um, here, they were automatically recoded to this kind of values because in the settings, we have an option here to, uh, that is activated by default to recode to and from extended missing values over here. Uh, but these are not Actually, the typical, the, the original missing values from, from the uh, ESS data set. I mean, ESS is European Social Survey data set. And I'm, I'm using the Spanish uh, data set for Wave 9. Um, and in order to show the original files, I'm going to uh, select SPSS and browse to the SPSS version over here. And uh, now we're going to look and see that, for instance, here we have seven, eight, nine for missing codes. We have triple, uh, quadruple, six, sevens, and eight, and nines. And, and here we have double, seven, double, eight. And that's a lot of codes. But notice that always refusal is, is using seven, sevens. And uh, here it's also seven, even though it has double, uh, uh, four, seven, so on. All right. Um, and in order to demonstrate how to produce uh, the DDI codebook file, I'm going to select here DDI codebook. By default, it's going to produce it in the same directory as the original uh, file, but you can save it on a different name and in a different folder. And there are some specific DDI XML uh, options over here, one of which is to embed the CSV dataset in, into the DDI codebook file. Now, as you've seen in our open presentation, DDI codebook was not originally about the data file. It's only about the metadata, but this is an improvement over the codebook and the resulting file is fully uh, compatible with the, with the XML schema of the DDI codebook. And now I'm gonna click convert. It's gonna take a while and you will notice here that another, another XML file will appear after this process will, um, will have um, finished. It's quite a um, large data set, close to 1,700 observations and, and about 600 variables, something like that. Now, here it is. And uh, let's look at it. Okay. And this is the XML produced by, the, uh, by stop convert. And you, you can see the document description, study description. It has minimal input. And you can either uh, add your own information with other uh, DDI instances and information or use a dedicated XML editor to fill in the rest of the information. You can see here, for instance, in the file description, there is a note section that is harmless for the overall consistency of the XML file, where I've saved the CSV uh, version of the, of the data. One other, I think, piece of information, and Arafan men mentioned ASCII uh, in uh, uh, dealing with uh, uh, data sets. Um, I would say that is not only ASCII, it's, it's, about, it's all about, the, um, for instance, the encoding of the data file, because sometimes the data sets contain not only uh, English letters, but also diacritics and so all sorts of other characters that are not presentable with ASCII, but with UTF-8 in, in my case. All right, so the next 
but, but so this was this was the most, most labor intensive. It does, as you can see, it does summary statistics. It it says. Uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the values, this is a categorical uh, character variable for the countries. And let's look at some other um, uh, variables, like over here, we have the internet use, and we have the values and the labels. And we, all, we also have the uh, values that are represented as a missing value. And we also have the frequency and uh, of course, some other summary statistics um, that are present in the in the file. For um, let's say here, yes, for numerical variables, as you can see, you have minimum, maximum, mean, median, sub deviation, and other uh, useful information that uh, uh, are populated in the DDI code book file. Um, the next part is to supplement the information uh, that is uh, produced by this software with a, another tool, for instance, uh, Nestor, since we've mentioned it, right? And um, Nestor, which looks like this, okay, I'm gonna open it. In fact, if the data set is in SPSS, because uh, originally they were using SPSS in, in, in uh, Nestor, it can import actually the study from the SPSS, like over here. Um, the part which is not okay, it doesn't know SAS, of course, it doesn't know startup. But for SPSS, it kind of works, but it's also not very good because uh, here, let's look at a variable, a variable that I know it has some special diacritics over here. It's a party last voted for uh, in Spain. As you can see, the value seven, eight, and nine, I, I, um, uh, corrupted over here. It doesn't know um, in, in encoding, test encoding. And that stuff. But otherwise, we can uh, use and import the XML file that we have just produced over here. All right. And now we can see it over here in data sets and we can look at the variables. And uh, okay, let me go into here. Okay. And the same variable. Here, now you can see 789, because I'm using UTF-8, uh, it's properly encoded. And we have the special diacritics in the XML file as well. So that's a plus over, over next. But otherwise, um, you can look at the variable fields in the document description file, the study description, and fill in as your uh, template uh, for the DDI file um, might, might look like. There are different templates for different organizations. Of course, not all of them have a need for all of the DDI um, information uh, buckets over there. But you can input information and save it, and you will, at the end, you will have a fully populated um, XML file containing, as you can see, both data and metadata and so on and so forth. So that would be a way to do uh, things or to have things done using graphical user interface. So these are nice, but not mandatory because these operations can be performed using R and R command script policy to be more exact, with the obvious advantage that um, it, they can be used um, in batch mode on servers uh, in, in production. Um, uh, in fact, the package DDI with R that I showed you here um, it is used in production by Gezis in Germany to uh, serve users with various file formats using uh, this technology. Now I'm going to open R Studio, which is a popular uh, R IDE, and uh, load the library DDI with R. R here, all right, and the um, command to uh, convert between different files. It's called convert. And it has a very simple structure over here. And as you can see, here is the um, is the command with all, all the base or uh, formal arguments over there. Uh, two of those I'm going to um, refer to uh, to it's they are activated by default, declared in a code. Like over here, they're um, um, specific to this one, recode and make the R data set declared. And declared is another R package that I will uh, talk about a little bit. Um, it's being designed especially for R users that 
have a need for multiple defined missing values. But originally, R has only one type of missing value, that is an A. Um, this package makes it possible to define and use multiple missing values the way uh, these um, variables have. For instance, here we have seven, eight, and nine. And uh, R by default is, uh, base R is not ready for this, but package declared makes it possible. All right. And recode, it's just recoding uh, to and from um, extending missing values. Now I'm going to convert the uh, SAS uh, data set uh, of the ESS. So convert. Oops. Okay. Um, and it's going to be uh, in the folder in SAS. Okay. And I'm going to have the uh, SAS 7 dat like that. All right, and again, by default, the record argument is active. So let's look, for instance, at the labels of the ESS net use soft. And these are the labels, and they have been recorded by default. But recording is not mandatory, it's option, right? So we can do this and say recode equals false, so deactivate that. And look at the labels again. And now you can see it has the original missing values, D, E, and F for refusal, don't know, and uh, not answer. So um, the SAS B7, 7B dat file, uh, it has, extended missing codes inside. And, and, and this is the improvement that I made in the past two weeks to make it possible to extract the metadata from the catalog file and use the extended missing files from the sas 7 dat file. Now, uh, to read this, it's easy to write extended missing files, it's complicated. In practice, um, uh, there is no R package that could uh, actually write a sas 7 dat file. Uh, properly, and uh, the package Haven, which is uh, DDI with R based on, upon, uh, they actually um, uh, uh, stopped uh, writing uh, these kinds of files and, and instead um, write transport files in SAS. But the downside of that is that transport files does not have the concept of extended missing files, so we have to recall. But this is what we, this argument is for, to give you flexibility. Now, in order to demonstrate how this is done, the recoding, the authentic recoding, this is prepared for the DDI lifecycle. I'm going to use a test data set, an SPSS one, where you can see some uh, missing values over here, where everywhere um, the value of 93, it's used for, for a non-response, right? So 93, minus 93 is everywhere is, an, is a non-response, right? over here. And um, let's take the stat transfer for instance and recode that for instance to stata. Oops, over here. Okay, I'm going to use the stata because I, I, I am able to write uh, uh, extended missing values in stata, not in SAS, unfortunately. So I'm going to transfer it. Um, yes, I'm going to uh, overwrite it. All right and read it now because it, it's it's written it in exactly the same folder here uh, so we have a dta file and read it with start transfer um convert uh okay so that's going to be in a i test dta and st looks like that now it has been recorded, it is not mandatory to recode. So, okay, recode false. Okay, ST. So, as you can see, the recoding the, uh, that start transport did was uh, to extend the missing value. They recoded it variable by variable. Whereas in SPSS, I have 93 all over and it should be of the same code. Start transfer uh, recoded. 93 with B in, um, and it's it would be similar in, in SAS. 
and A at variable T. So that's, that's not, uh, I, I was not happy with that. Uh, by, by contrast, I am going to now convert a test sound, okay, to start off. All right, so it, now it overwrite, it overridden the, the same file. And I'm going to uh, name it Stata again here. And Stata now, as you can see, the extended missing files from SPSS, the original 93, it's consistently recoded as, a, as an extended missing value. So, so you have at least exactly the same missing value over all variables. So that is preparing for um, uh, the DDI lifecycle in reusability principles. And um, you heard from Alina that uh, originally the code book is not ready for metadata reuse. In this particular, I mean, it's true in the sense that it cannot reuse, for instance, code lists or uh, controlled vocabularies across studies, but within the same data set, it can reuse, for instance, the information uh, uh, about variable labels in the same way that the source uses a catalog. So that's possible to do in DDI codebook. And uh, um, I am looking for a way to develop, further develop the DDI with our package to reuse this kind of information within a DDI uh, a codebook instance. So thus paving the way for a smooth transition to DDI lifecycle, which is the long-term improvement I want to make over this package. Um, another development intention I have is to actually replace Nestar with an application similar to Stop Converter over here. So the technology is there. Uh, it's just a matter of time and effort to put in in order to uh, make a, uh, um, uh, an interface, a graphical user interface similar to this. It's not that complicated, it just takes a lot of time and a little bit of effort. But this is also one of my um, uh, development objectives to it, so that people could have an open source uh, tool suit in order to facilitate the DDI codebook and life cycle uh, production. So that would be all on my part. I'm going to uh, stop sharing here and uh, answer questions. Thank you, Adrian. Um, so we only have a few minutes left. Are there are there questions for Adrian or or more general questions for anyone? You can raise your hand, put something in the chat. I've tried to answer a couple of questions that came up while you were presenting, Adrian, in the chat. Okay. Okay. Those were not good enough answers. Then people should should um, say so. What we have. Um, okay. It, the question is, is it possible to work with DDI-L without using a commercial tool? And the answer to that is yes. Um, the, uh, most people are using Collectica because that is convenient for a lot of organizations. But INSEE, for instance, I, they may have, they, they developed their own software because of their internal requirements and what they were doing. And um, they would be a good, a good organization to talk to because they're not averse to using commercial tools, but they ended up building all of their own. Now, now they might be willing to share some of that if they have similar requirements. Um, people can certainly work with DDI Lifecycle. There are libraries and a lot of, of informal uh, software out there that people can use. There is not, to my knowledge, a lot of, um, of open source, but there is some. Um, you saw the mention of rich data services. I think they they support some um, information, some functionality around DDI lifecycle that is open source. But they also they also do additional uh, consulting work around that. I believe you'd have to you'd have to look. The company there is Metadata Technology North America. They're not the UK version of that company. They're the, the American branch. Um, but again, talking. I, oh, Alina's uh, posted a, a link about Pogues at Insee which is one of their key uh, metadata tools there. And um, it may be that, that you wanna take a look at that and, um, and talk to some of the other implementers because they're, it's a, a community driven, I would say. There are a lot of people doing a lot of different things with DDI Lifecycle um, and they're happy to share code because they're developing their own tools. 
There is also within the DDI Alliance, a developers group for, for where people can go and learn more about how different tools are being implemented in different organizations. And that that is a recent development in the past few months that that group has come back together and started being more active. So that would be something you could you could get engaged with if you if you like. But there's not a lot of uh, a large scale open source packages as such um, for DDI lifecycle, more so the kind of thing that Adrian's been showing you for um, for Codebook. Is that a good answer to the question? I'm not seeing a response, so I think that's I think that comes maybe up. maybe I can supplement by saying that there is a um, uh, DDI programmers work group that is starting to um, uh, look for ways. Um, we there is there already has been a, a hackathon around this, and they are starting to look for ways to develop open source software to do DDI lifecycle as well. So stay tuned; uh, they might appear in um, in yeah. some time. There are some there are some open source packages out there, Adrian, not of the latest version, though, I think. And I'm hoping that it, some of those tools will get updated. But but that's it's good. It's good to mention that because there's a lot of interest in that currently. Um, I. Are there any other questions? I would ask you, David, you 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 had requested that we that we do this. Um, did did you get what you needed from this from this session? And um, what are the next uh, steps? Yeah. Um... Yeah, I, I'll, I'll tell you what, uh, what we are currently indeed doing. Um, we have already contacted with Statistic Denmark uh, to share their experience with DDI and the use of Collectica. That's uh, firstly, then the, we have also collected with Collectica themselves. Um, we have, we have uh, let them know um, our, main, um, our main goal with the use of DDI, just yes, to, to use it to um, create the metadata for our internal repository, our um, preliminary repository. And um, we are organizing some sessions just yes, to get in contact with the tool. And um, uh, the experts that uh, we have now in this session have already made an um, with uh, with their own tools, I mean, with with, with their own efforts, uh, had made some preliminary efforts to write the metadata for one of these files in key value performs in the, in our repository using uh, the, um, the documentation from the DDI Alliance. So we are just getting some momentum um, about uh, the use of DDI. Uh, we have to make some internal decisions um, about uh, the adoption of, of the standard at the institutional level. Uh, for us, this session and this webinar has been um, perfectly suited to our needs. Uh, we now have to recap, we now have to exchange uh, views and see how we make this the next step. We will keep on. Um, uh, we will keep on uh, contact with um, our, uh, the Danish colleagues. Uh, now uh, you suggest uh, you suggest that uh, INSEE is also a very good point of reference. We will try to also to contact them, um, and uh, we, we 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 need to 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 see. I mean, we 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 need now to organize with all this information. We would be very grateful if you can share the record of the um, the record of the of the of the session, um, and if possible, also the slides. And mm -hmm. uh, we 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 shall come back to you uh, to you then, uh, right? So um, I think that. Uh, Clearly, the DDI standard um, is very, very, very close to, to our needs. Um, it is clearly suitable for um, microdata documentation, as you have very clearly explained. And then uh, we, need, we need to plan and take decisions uh, regarding the steps ahead. Okay, David, I, I think that's great. As you make decisions, please, please keep, uh, keep us in the loop. Um, sure, sure. I can give you some contacts with with INSEE, uh, there's a, a, a member, uh, there's a guy in INSEE, uh, Christoph Jukowski, uh, I always get his name wrong, um, 
he's he's in Paris and he is doing a lot of work with their with DDI. He would be a good contact, but there's also a guy who is just retired and now become a consultant, Frank Coton, oh. who's also still very active in the DDI world. And he might be somebody you could talk to to get uh, um, some information about um, about using DDI. And he he probably would have a good perspective. He is one of the, the guys organizing that Cosmos conference I told you about, but oh, well, we'd be happy to introduce you to people like those or the people at, at UKDA who are doing key value work. As you make those decisions and figure out what you're trying to do, um, maybe we can help introduce you to some of the people that, that okay. would be useful for you to talk per to. Perfect. We will, we will, um, uh, we will take the, the note um, of of the conferences here in Europe. Uh, we will try to attend. Uh, I think that there will be an important input for us, uh, uh, um, um, an opportunity to share experiences with with the experts who are already using the the DDI standard. So uh, for sure, um, uh, we will keep you in the loop. We, uh, we, we will keep in contact and uh, thank you very, very much for, for this webinar. We are most grateful for this. Uh, if any of my colleagues want to make any uh, comment or, or any uh, suggestion, proposal or, or, or question, please uh, go ahead. Uh, we. Again, thank you uh, uh, um, your efforts in, in introducing us to, 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 to the TDI standard. Well, well, thanks for giving us your attention for two hours. I know it's a lot of information and, um, and good, good luck with this. We're happy, we're happy to help you out. That's, that, that's what we do. So um, yeah, and so we'll, we'll, be in, we'll be in touch, David. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Thanks, everybody. Thank Bye. you. Thank you, Bye. Thank thank you very much. Bye. Bye.